Oh, there it is. And Brian Russell just joined too there. So. All right. And uh, Brian Russell is with us as well. Brian, will you say hello to the group? <laughs> Brian, Brian is past president as well. Uh, Sonia Huang is also past president. We're all in this for life. So uh, we're here to help you be better mortgage originators. So I'm so excited to be able to have our speaker today, Gordon. He's going to be able to share the insights of credit. He's only been doing it for a minute, right? How long have you been doing credit now, Gordon? Oh, about 25 years. <laughs> You're not even that old. How can that be? Oh, no. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon has always been a huge supporter of CAMP and our mortgage-related industries and has always had great insight in the changes that we've seen coming up with credit and how it's going to impact your buyers. So, Gordon, if you would like to take it away and educate us. Yeah, I'll be happy to. Thank you so much, everybody. And happy Friday. Happy uh, Veterans Day to all the veterans out there. Um, you know, I'm honored to be uh, speaking for the association. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, TJ. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Make sure everybody can see it OK in a second here. All right. All right, can, you, can everybody see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. All right, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, gonna you know, touch base on some of the you know, fundamental components about credit, you know, what your credit score is made of, you know, what factors are you know, important to have a good credit score. You know, I'll provide some tips on how to maintain good credit. Some of the, I'll you know, maybe address some of the misconceptions about credit. <clears throat> and then at the end, we're going to talk about some really hot off the press topics, some really new things that are happening in credit that was just announced a couple of weeks ago that's going to impact our industry um, in the next coming few years. So uh, if there's any questions while I'm going through my presentation, feel free to ask questions. I don't mind taking questions along the way. Um, so let's get started. <clears throat> so let's just talk about FICO scoring models. So many of you may or may not know, I mean, there's many different FICO score models out there. There's approximately 69 different scoring models in the industry. Um, you know, every industry has their own scoring model. If you go purchase an automobile, your, your auto finance company is gonna pull an auto for FICO model. If you apply for a credit card, you're gonna, they're gonna pull a credit card scoring model. So there's many different models out there. Of course, in our industry, in the mortgage industry, we work specifically with the mortgage FICO classic model, and that ranges from a 350 to an 850. Now, the ones that you or your borrowers might see are the ones that are the consumer scores. So when your borrower goes out, they pull their own credit. Um, they may have monitoring services. They may use Credit Karma. They may use, you know, their credit card company might offer them free credit reports. So they're getting a consumer FICO scoring model, and that, that model ranges from a 150 to a 950. So consumer so let, let, let me stop yeah. you real quick, Gordon, sure, and, sure. and introduce this because, you know, I, I, I have been in the industry a long, long time. I was working for this little company that had uh, 250 loan programs called Headlands. And Mr. Isaacs from Fair Isaacs uh, score, <laughs> FICO score, he came in and announced this thing called credit modeling and risk score. And we said, oh, my goodness, this will never take off. It's discriminatory. Well, here we are uh, 25 years later, <laughs> and, we, and we are dealing with all of the ins and outs. So just for those of you who don't have the history, that's a, a little way to know about that. Absolutely right. So, I mean, that's been the primary scoring model we've been using since. Um, there's some changes going to be happening in the next few years we'll talk about in a bit. But, um, but so the most important thing to take away from the scoring model is, you know, when your borrower pours their own credit, they come to you and say, hey, I have a 700 credit score. Well, keep in mind, that's not a mortgage credit score. So when you pull credit for them through your credit provider, the scores are going to probably be lower. So on average, I would say a consumer score is about 25 to 50 points higher than a mortgage credit score. So if you're going to try to use that credit report that your borrower brought to you as a starting point or reference, just keep that in mind. I mean, you probably just deduct 25 to 50 points, and that's probably where they're going to be when you actually pull their mortgage FICO score. 
Okay. And of course, you know, we can't use consumer scores for mortgage lending purposes. The lender is always going to be using the mortgage FICO scores. And as far as the, you know, what, which mortgage FICO score are we using? And it, within the mortgage industry, there are various mortgage scores too. I mean, there's over 15 different versions of mortgage FICO scores. So the ones that are accepted right now by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to do government and uh, enterprise loans is the Experian Fair Isaac version two, the TransUnion FICO Classic 04, and the Equifax FICO Classic version five factor. Those are the only three versions that are accepted right now. We're all gonna talk about some changes that is taking place in that um, field right now. Some recent announcement that took place last month that's gonna change the versions of the FICO scores. And we'll talk about that at the end, okay? So what makes up your credit scores? So the largest component of your credit score is your payment history. This is going to be, you know, how many, are you making your payments on time on every account? Not, not any specific type of account, but your mortgage, your credit card, your auto loans. It's very important that you make all your payments before 30 days. Otherwise, it becomes 30 days late. That falls into that 35% of your uh, credit score chart. And that's going to have a huge impact on someone's credit score. So payment history is the most, number one most important thing to maintain good credit. The, the second largest component of your credit score comprise of your balances. And you know, so there's two things we look at here. The, the algorithms look at your overall balance on all your accounts um, in relation to the credit limit available. Then they also look at the individual accounts. So on your revolving accounts. So any credit card that you have, your, they look at your balance to high credit ratio on each individual account. And that's probably more important. That has more weight than the first factor. So it's very important to keep all your credit card balances below 30%. So that's, that's the second largest part that takes up your credit score. And the other three parts, your, your um, length of credit history, of course, the algorithm looks at how long you've established credit. They want to see that most of your accounts are open for at least two years. So if you have two years of credit history on each of your accounts, that's going to be more favorable. Types of credit and new credit. These are things like how many new inquiries are you getting? How many new loans are you opening or new accounts you're opening? That's all going to factor into your score. Uh, opening a lot of new accounts may have a detrimental impact on your score. Every time you apply for credit and they pull your credit, that could have a de detrimental impact on your score. So these are all factors that make up your credit score. Now, when we look at What's a good credit profile, a healthy mix of credit? So this is kind of an example of a very um, you know, optimal credit file. You should have at least two installment loans with balances. And installment loans are uh, mortgages, um, auto loans, student loans. Those are considered installment loans. So you should have at least two of those with balances. You should have at least three revolving accounts with less than 10% balance to credit ratio. Revolving accounts would be, of course, your, your typical credit cards, Master Visa, Discover, Amex, but it also includes your retail cards, you know, your Target card, um, your gas card with Shell or Chevron. Those are all considered revolving accounts the same way as any you know, national credit card as well. So um, you know, have at least three of those. Hey, Gordon. Yes. A quick question on the, the credit cards, revolving accounts in particular. Is there any difference in the scoring models anyway, if you make your minimum payments on a regular basis or if you charge and then pay it off in full every month? That's a great, great question, Jack. Uh, if you asked me that three years ago, I would years say ago? no. Yeah, I, I knew it changed. Right. Yep. Uh, and so uh, one of the changes are the trended data that now is being incorporated into your credit score and in the underwriting decision. So the trended data does look at your payment history in the last 24 months, whether or not you paid the minimum, whether or not you paid in full. So that does factor into the decision now with trended data where it didn't before. Before, we were just looking at a snapshot of your credit report at the time they pulled it. So mm -hmm. yes, to answer your question, yes, that does. Um, factor into it now. And and, and just I, along that same lines, um, I, I have you know new buyers who go in and they're like, yeah, I'm great. I, I don't have any debt. 
you know, they use their credit cards, they have credit, but they pay it off every month and they don't carry any balance or they pay it off every week before it's even due. And they don't carry a, carry a balance and they have no score because they haven't actually proven their ability to pay a monthly bill. So one of the things I do advise my clients is keep a low, low, less than 10% balance on your account and pay the minimum payment once or twice a year. You can pay it off the rest yes. of the time, but it's going to give you a healthier credit history because you paid them a little interest. They're going to like you a little bit more. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's a good point, TJ, because it's if someone doesn't hold a balance every month and it's just all their credit cards are zero balances, you're right. They may not get a credit score because it doesn't show any active activity. So really, the, this may be this should be revised to say less than 10%, but more than 1%. <laughs> so it really should be between one to 10% because you do want to hold a small balance to make sure you're going to get scored. And really you, you don't have, if you don't have to have a, um, a balance on all your credit cards, you just need to have it on one credit card. So if you have five credit cards, you want four of them paid off in, to zero, that's fine. But if you, you just have to have, make sure you have one credit card with a balance to get scored. Okay. Gordon, we, we have a question in the chat box. How do sure. they rate people who've paid off their mortgage already free and clear and they have no more installment? Are they just going to use the history and how long ago that happened? Or, you know, when does it when does it become a negative that you have no installments? Sure. And then they do look at your history. So if you have an installment loans that are zero balances, that's still going to be fine because it does show in your profile that you have some installment loans in your in your profile. Um, if it has a balance or doesn't have a balance, that's really not a big factor because balances on installment loans are not looked at the same way as balances on a revolving account. So it's yeah, okay. they're actually looking yeah. at, the, at the history piece. And right. so if you've had an installment loan, what they're looking at is you had a, you know, 360 payment installment loan and you paid it off in 240 or you right. had a, you know, a three-year car note, you paid off in two. They're looking at those 24 months of paying an installment debt on time, even if it's over three years. If it is over after three years, uh, it, it does have, it doesn't improve your score as much, but it still counts as your, the age of the credit item helps you with your rating as well. So don't close those, that first credit card that you got that you, you know, that target or whatever it was, don't close that if that's your first credit card, because the age of your credit profile helps your points. A absolutely. And that's, <clears throat> that's exactly, that's exactly right, TJ. And so, you know, of course, the other, you know, things that they look at, you know, make sure you don't have any collections, no late payments, no uh, charge offs, public records like bankruptcies, all those, of course, if you have any of those, then that's going to have a big uh, detriment to your credit. And of course, what TJ just mentioned, they're looking for accounts with long payment history <clears throat> and low balances. So you want to make sure you, if you have accounts that's been open for a long time, keep them open because they're still looking at your history from the open date to the report date. And the longer you have a history on these accounts, the better it is for your score. Hey, that's a good rule of thumb, long and low. Keep it long and low. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Ka Kathy, our treasurer who has joined us, welcome, Kathy. Do you want me to ask the question for you or do you want to ask it? Go ahead. You can ask it. All right. So if you pay off your credit card balances every month, doesn't a balance still show at the point in time that your credit is pulled? Would that count as a, in your score as a positive? Yes. Hi, Kathy. Good to see you or hear from you. Uh, <laughs> yes. So it so your credit score is still looking at what's on your what, what balance is on your credit at the time they pulled it. So even though we have trended data now, the trended data looks at your last 24 months of history, but it's also looking at what your current balance is at the time you pull your credit. So yes, if you're, if you're even if you're paying off, your, if you're paying off your credit card in full every month, or you're not paying it off in full every month, whatever the balance is showing at the time they pull your credit is definitely being factored into your score, positive or negative, depending on what your balance is. Great, thank you. Sure. Another so, question before you, you go into this very important delinquency and how they're rated, um, sure. and, and it's along that same line, when a new, when is a new account and new inquiry go away as a negative? What is the seasoning it. for it to not impact you? Sure. And that, that's the simple answer is 12 months. So inquiries stay on your credit 
it, well, it stays on your credit for 24 months because you'll see it on your credit report for 24 months, but it's only, it's only um, factored into your score for the first 12 months. So, so it only impacts your score for one year. Okay. And the reason why an inquiry actually impacts your score is because a credit inquiry is done in the hopes of granting you debt. And by it not being turned into an account, um, it actually looks like you were denied. And so that's why inquiries themselves, even though they may have nothing to do with denial, have everything to do with the fact that you were shopping for a car loan or shopping for a home loan. Uh, those inquiries were the attempt to grant you credit and it wasn't fulfilled. And that's why it comes as a negative. I know it seems kind of backwards, but they haven't <laughs> changed it yet. Right, Gordon? That's exactly right. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself, TJ. <laughs> All right, so uh, delinquencies on your credit. So most of the items or derogatory items on your credit stays on your credit for seven years and then it drops off. So your late payments, collections, charge-offs, you know, uh, chapter 13, after seven years from the time they were reported, they are supposed to drop off your credit. There's a few items that can stay on your credit for 10 years. That would be your chapter seven and chapter 11 bankruptcy. Tax liens used to stay on your credit for 10 years. We, now tax liens are no longer reported on your credit reports. So that's kind of a moot point now, um, but seven years is pretty much mo most items, okay? So here's some recent changes to the credit report. And when I say recent, some of these are, you know, three years ago, and that's considered recent because the FICO score models really don't, don't have many move, much movement. I mean, in the last 25 years, we have seen very little changes in the, in the FICO scoring algorithm and model. Trended data was one of the biggest things that happened, but here's a few other things. Um, so judgments and tax liens no longer report to the bureaus. And this was just something that happened a couple of years ago. Um, and it was because it's, there's so many errors on people's credit reports when it comes to judgments and tax liens. It's just, there was no accurate way to report it because a lot of, a lot of these items are not cross-referenced by social. It's based on a name and address of a, of a consumer. So we, we, you know, there were so many errors reporting to the bureaus that the bureaus just at one point, along with the, the government agencies decided they're not gonna report it anymore. So judgments, tax liens no longer show up on your credit reports. Um, in order to get that information, if you're doing a loan, you need to order a separate report called just, well, um, J and T or T and J reports. That's your judgments and tax liens report specifically just for that information. Okay. Now, collection agencies cannot report a collection until after 180 days from the time it went to collections. So give the borrowers or the consumer more time to pay off that debt before it gets reported. So this, you know, in the past, once, once a uh, a creditor assigns it to a collection agency, they can report it to the credit bureaus right away. Now they have to wait six months before they can do that. So this is you know, good for the consumer, gives them more time to take care of that debt without impacting their credit. Um, and last year- and, and, as a, Gordon, I just yeah. came across something and, and I think Angela's on the, on the uh, webinar. Angela, what was the name of that generic collection company? Can you share that with us? The generic, um, it was called. Um, I mean, a medical collection. Medical payment data, I think. Yes, yes. medical payment data, yes. Oh yep. my gosh, this is a horrendous thing to deal with if anybody's come across it. Gordon, do you have any tips for that uh, that collection company um, that isn't accountable to anybody? Yeah, medical payment data, I believe, was acquired by NCO Collections. So... You know, it is hard to track them down because it's such a generic name. People look at it and say, what is this? Is this a medical collections? But it is a company and that was acquired and part of NCO collections. So that maybe look up NCO collections to, to find their information. If anybody comes across that, it can have a huge impact on people's score. If they're showing a collection or they got paid and then they're showing the collection is from now, even if it was six years ago because it got paid recently, that, that you know, it, th that's one of those ones that may not pay to pay, you know, um, yep. it, it gets you in trouble. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit in, in one of the slides too. Um, but as of last year, July 1st, 2022, paid medical collections are not factored into your scores and should be removed. Then also something new this next year, beginning next year, unpaid medical collections under $500 will not be reported. 
So there's a really good push to help consumers, especially in the medical collections field, because we know so many medical um, collections are because someone had insurance, but the insurance didn't cover the copay or there was a percentage that wasn't covered. And a lot of times the consumers aren't even aware of this until it goes to collections. So that's why there's so many of these now laws are trying to be more favorable to consumers when it comes to medical collections. Okay. Hey, Gordon, is there an underlying section of the law that, you know, because a lot of times those companies are nightmare to deal with and mm -hmm. if the borrower can quote the law saying, look, you can't report it, please remove it. If we had that underlying section of the law, it would be a lot easier to help our consumers. Yeah, and a lot of these are policies by the bureaus. It's under the FCRA. Um, trade re or the Federal Trade Commission would also release some um, guidance on this. So I, I can't point to a specific <clears throat> provision or law right now. I mean, I can probably research it and get it back to you. And feel free to email me and, and I, can, uh, I can see what I can find for you. So Ray, generically, you can say it's FACRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act of, I don't remember the year now, um, and that, that requires them to give a speedy, you know, 30 days on this, you know, response between these times. Um, it, it, FACRA is usually what you can quote, but I don't know, section and code, but, you know. Correct. Um, some, other, some other new things in the industry in the last few years are self-reported trade lines. And this is from the bureaus. So Experian came out with a product called Experian Boost, which they allow you to self-report your cell phone bills, utility bills, some other types of non-traditional accounts. Um, now, keep in mind that doesn't impact your mortgage FICO score. It only affects the different version of the FICO score, which is the FICO 08 scoring model. So if you're doing a loan for your borrower and you know, you're trying to improve their scores, adding these types of account is not going to impact the score. However, keep in mind, the lenders are looking at the DTI. So they are, they are counting the balances to your um, on these accounts. So it, it may go against the borrower to have these types of accounts on their credit report because the balance is being counted, but it's not helping the scores, okay? So we are seeing a lot of lenders um, asking to remove these types of accounts from the credit report before funding the loan. Um, it may help you in certain situations if, if you know, the borrower doesn't have enough credit and the lender is specifically asking you to the borrower to add some non-traditionals, then it may help. But in, a, in other cases, it may hurt. Okay. And then we talked about trended data a little bit. And again, this is something that's relatively new in the, in the credit world too. I mean, it's trended data came out a few years ago, but you know, it, it was really a, a paradigm shift from the old way of looking at credit scores, where it was just a one-time one snapshot of your credit score based on what's on your credit at the time. So, you know, it was kind of a big loophole there because back then you can have a borrower or a consumer that, you know, has their credit card maxed out for the last 24 months and they only paid a minimum, but right before they do the loan, they pay off their debt. So when you pull their credit, all the credit score can see is that your debt was paid off and they, they don't even factor in the fact that you've been maxed out and paying a minimum for the last 24 months, which, which makes you a higher risk to the lender and the GSEs. So that's why they created trended data. So now they can look, at, look back at 24 months of history and incorporate that into the decision. Um, so that was a pretty big change. Um, let's move to the next. All right, so this is a pretty hot topic. That's, and this may be impacting a lot of you out there, if you're doing loans, basically, you know, when you pull your credit, or when you pull credit on a borrower, they're getting bombarded by phone calls, being solicited by other, uh, you know, lenders to try to take away your borrowers, um, your client, basically. <clears throat> so this is called trigger leads, and there is a solution. Um, so trigger leads are being sold by the bureaus. I just want to point that out. It, it's not being sold by your credit provider. So don't blame it on your credit providers. <laughs> it's the bureaus that are selling this information. We as a credit company, we don't like that practice. We, we find it you know, very unfair, but we can't stop them from doing it. So the consumers can opt out. So they can go to, or they can go on a do not call registry. So if they wanna opt out, they would go to you know, the website, <clears throat> optoutprescreen.com, or they can call the toll-free number. Uh, keep in mind that it does take about five to seven days before the opt-out goes into effect. So if feasible, you wanna see if your borrower can opt out before five days, five to seven days before you actually pull their credit. And that's not always possible, but if you can, that would help. 
Um, they can also go to the do not call registry and also be removed from those lists. <clears throat> um, I've heard from different brokers in the past that when they opt out, they have the borrower opt out that helps their credit scores. I don't, that really hasn't been proven. I mean, the opt out is not a factor in the score model. That's not something that credit scores uh, algorithm looks at. So I think if the score has improved when you opt your borrower out, I believe it's purely coincidental. Something else probably happened to help the score go up. Okay, the other thing that we can do, uh, pre-qual soft pull reports. This is really popular right now. So basically you can pull a soft pull on a borrower uh, when, you're, when you're first taking on their loan. You can get their scores, you can get their liabilities and make a determination whether or not you can do the loan for this person. And that's, you know, you can do that without alerting your competitors because a soft pull is not going to be part of that trigger lead. So if you pull a soft pull, None of your competitors will know about it and they won't be able to solicit your borrower. And there are lenders who actually can do a full AUS for DU and LP with a soft pull. So they can actually do a full approval underwrite, not have to pull a hard pull until you get in the contract. Um, and that is one way of, there are some really deceptive practices by some of the lenders out there promising them the moon and the stars, even though it's not valid because they know nothing about the file because they, you know, bought the lead. Um, so, you know, it's, it's confusing for these consumers. So anything you do to have them opt out is great. Um, but do know that it does take five to seven days for that to impact. Um, I did have all of my past clients opt out um, so that they were protected from this, from any future stuff that's going to go on. Correct. Is there a misconception about omitting or, or leaving out the phone number and email address when you go to pull the report. So pull the report, then put the there, phone number. Yeah, and, and there is, and I hear that quite a bit too, Jack. Yeah. So, so when you pull credit, I mean, we're like, we're not sending the phone numbers to the bureaus. We're only sending the name, social address, date of birth mm -hmm. and, and previous address. So even though you're entering it in there, we're not passing it on to the bureaus. Um, so omitting it is really not gonna make a difference. It's, yeah. the, the bureaus are looking at the inquiry only. And then once mm -hmm. they see the inquiry, they pull up that consumer's profile. They have their phone numbers in there already and they're passing down on that information. Yeah, so, All yeah right. thank so, you for the clarification. Yeah. No problem. Hey, hey, hey Gordon, uh, Brian yes. here. Just a quick question with regards to the soft pull versus hard pull. Yep. Um, is, is there any idea as to how different the, uh, the pull will be? So reflective on their credit report, if I, if I do a soft pull to run a pre-approval on a borrower, and then I eventually have to do a hard pull, can I anticipate a pretty significant difference in those reports? No, not at all, because the, the hard, the, our soft pulls and hard pulls use the same exact FICO scores. So it should be identical. If you're pulling it side by side, it's identical. Now, of course, if you're waiting two weeks before you pull the hard pull, there could be some changes to the credit score because of exactly. changes on the credit file in two weeks, but it's not nothing to do with the version of the score. The version of the scores are gonna be the same. So it's not like the credit karma scores or the you know other scoring models. Our soft pools are going to be the same as the hard pool scores. Okay. I didn't realize you could run an AUS with those. I thought that was not uh, an option. Um, it, it's only piloted by certain lenders. Correct. But For instance, you, uh, you, I'm sorry. That PRMG. Yes. Gordon, <laughs> um, sorry. This this is Deb. Can the broker own desktop originator with a soft pull report? Only you, you can submit the liabilities. Well, no, you, you can't run AUS with the soft pool, no, unless you're one of those pilot that TJ's talking about. Okay. But that's a, that's a handful of lenders only. But no, you cannot run an AUS. Okay. Um, so let's look at, here's some credit myths that we're going to cover. Rate shopping window. So the rate shopping window is the same for all, all bureaus. That's not true. TransUnion and Equifax has a 45-day grace period window where you can pull credit on the same borrower multiple times within a 45-day period, and it's only treated as one inquiry, whereas Experian has a 15-day grace period window, so it's different for the, the, the bureaus. Um, another myth, paying off delinquencies will remove them from your credit report. That is not true also. I mean, if you have a late on a credit card, you know, and you pay off that credit card and close it, that late doesn't go away. That late still stays on your credit report for seven years, okay? Opening new accounts will help your credit score. And that, that's, it depends. I mean, if you don't have enough credit 
and you have a very thin credit file, maybe opening up new accounts may help you. But if you already have established credit, then you don't need to have any more accounts. You, if you open up a new one, that may actually hurt your score. So that may depend. Um, your credit is affected by how much money you owe or have in your checking or savings account. That's not true as well. Nothing in your bank account affects your credit scores. Okay. And here's some other common questions I run into. Will paying off a collection remove it from the credit report? Answers, no. When you pay off a collection, typically they just show it as a paid collection and they won't remove it unless you actually negotiated that in the terms of paying your, your payment. So, you know, when it comes to collections, you always want to negotiate a deletion of the collection account. Otherwise, it's, it, it's not going to help your credit score. Okay. Should I pay off the collection agency or the creditor? You always want to work with the collection agency. Once it goes to collection, it's the collection agency that's reporting it, not the creditor. If you pay the creditor off directly, they may not communicate with the collection company and that collection company or that collection account is still on your credit report, still impacting your score. Okay. Now, can paying off a collection actually hurt my score? And that's true in most cases. So in most cases, when you pay off a collection and you don't get it removed, it's either going to lower your score or it's going to have no impact. It may just stay the same. Now, it may lower in the case where the collection is an old collection. It was, you know, it stopped reporting three years ago, but now that you paid it, it refreshed the date of payment, it refreshed the reported date, and now that collection looks like a new collection, even though it has a zero balance, that's still going to have a, a negative impact on your score. Okay. And uh, the, the amount of the collection doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a $1 collection or a $1,000 collection, it's still going to have the same impact. It's the, it's the collection itself that's hurting your scores. Okay. Some tips, credit tips, avoid co-signing for loans. Um, because of course, wherever you co-sign for, it's also on your credit. If they miss a payment, that, that missed payment is going to show up on your credit as well. If you're willing to take that risk for your family member or loved one, that's fine. But keep that in mind that it could certainly impact your credit as well. Don't close or old revolving accounts with good credit history. If you have accounts that's been open for a long time, it's helping you. If you close it, that's going to stop that account from uh, factoring into your score. So. Um, don't open new accounts unless you really have to, because every time you open a new account, there's a new inquiry that could impact your score. That new account has a very short credit history. So within the first two years, it's probably having a negative impact on your score as well. Okay. Add yourself as an authorized user if needed. So if you're working with someone that has, you know, um, not enough trade lines, not enough credit history, then they can add themselves to someone else's credit card as an authorized user. And then that would benefit, they would be able to benefit from the whole term of that account. So if that credit card has been open for five years, your borrower that, that, is, that, that the, is the authorized user will also have five years of credit history from that account. So that can help a particular person as well. Of course, you wanna pay your bills before it reaches the 30 day mark. It doesn't get reported to the bureaus until 30 days late. So I mean, you always wanna make sure you make that payment before then. I mean, you, you know, if, if you miss your payment, you're, let's say you're five days late, don't say, well, I'm late already. Let's just wait till the next month and I'll pay both because now you're gonna get that 30 day late. So make sure you make all your payments before the 30 day late mark, okay? Uh, and always keep at least one credit card with a small balance. And we kind of talked about this earlier with TJ. If you have all zero balances on a credit card, you may not get a score. So you always wanna make sure you have one credit card with a balance, okay? Um, you know, if you want to dispute anything on your credit that's not accurate or just not updated, you can always go to annualcreditreport.com, get a copy of your free credit report, and it's a very easy for you to dispute things online on this website. Um, so that may be something that your, you or your consumers can do to make sure your credit is updated and there's no errors. <clears throat> Let's talk about some credit card utilization because this is a big factor on your credit score. The optimal balance is 10% or lower than, you know, compared to your credit limit. If they can't do that, at least get it below 30% of your credit limit, and that would be a more favorable uh, balance to high credit ratio on each credit card, okay? Um, you know, it, it's ideal uh, amount of accounts to have balances on are three. If you have more than three accounts with balances, then that's probably going to go, you know, be treated negatively, okay? Now, you know, a borrower can have even, you know, no late payments at all. A borrower that has no, uh, you know, no derogatory history, but they have a bunch of credit cards that are maxed out, they may still have a pretty low score. 
Okay, so that's how important balance to credit ratios are. You want to make sure that those balances are all below 30%. Okay. Hey, Gordon, we got a question from uh, Mark Tran there. Sure. Mark, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, Gordon, could you go back to the last uh, slide? Sure, absolutely. This one or? Uh, no, the one, one, let's see. This one, yeah. That's for the uh, dispute. If you, if you just go, if I just go to uh, annualcreditreport.com to report it, does yep. it affect all three credit bureaus or just one? Yeah, you can order all three credit bureaus here and dispute all three credit. And it's a, it's, a, it's a soft pull, so it has no impact on your score. And you're entitled to one free credit report a year on this website. So when, when, when a borrower dispute through the uh, annual credit report, it will change all three? Yeah, so when you go there, you're getting three separate reports. So you, you know, you're not getting a tri merge. So you're getting okay. one, each bureau individually, and then you would dispute each of them one at a time. So they have to, you know, dispute all three. Okay, so the the borrower have to call all three bureaus to do that. But online, it's all done online. Okay, all right, yeah. thank you. It's pretty easy to do. Wouldn't they work, work with the creditor that was reporting the data rather than the bureau? Not necessarily. I mean, they can do that. That's one approach, but you can also just dispute things directly on the bureau, especially if it's in a closed account, something that's old, mm -hmm. you know, the creditor is no longer able to, you know, you can't access the creditor for whatever reason. So the bureaus are easy to dispute it that way. Okay. okay. All right. Now let's, so that, let's talk about some of the hot off the press stuff. This is stuff that just, that's happening right now and it's going to impact us in the next few years. So, on October 24th, just last month, Sandra Thompson, director of the FHFA, she announced the validation and approval of both the FICO 10T and the Vantage Score 4.0 scoring models to be used by Fannie and Freddie in the underwriting of their loans. And this is huge because, you know, like I said, we've been using the classic FICO model for the last 20 years. So this is a significant change in the score models. Um, and this was all prompted by regulation. Section 310 is, you know, you know, one of the regulatory agencies that said they worked with the um, with the bureaus, with the FHFA, and say we need to come up with a better scoring system. The scoring system that we've been using for the last 20 years, they found to be unfair. They found to be inaccurate. So this is really something that they've been working on for almost 10 years now to come up with a better scoring model. And this is. This is the culmination of their research in the last 10, you know, throughout the last 10 years. Okay. <clears throat> now, according to the FHFA, these, these new models are going to be more accurate, more inclusive, and will provide more enhanced safety and soundness in, in the housing market. What does that mean? Let's dive into these scores a little bit. More accurate. So they, like I said, they've been they've been researching this for almost a decade. They've been testing it with millions of loan files and consumers. And they've determined that these two new scores have met or surpassed the testing that they've done to determine that these are going to be more accurate scores and more fair to the consumers. Okay, more inclusive. Okay, now since both of these scoring models incorporate alternative payment history, such as rent, utilities, and telecom payments, like cell phone bills and whatnot, um, it will now open the door to more borrowers being able to qualify for a loan because now they're looking at these score models are going to look at utility bills and you know most people that live in a house rent a part rent or own a house they have utility bills so this is going to certainly in include a lot more people in that um, you know in, in the loan that, that that qualifies for loans okay uh, enhanced safety and soundness. So according to FHFA, using these models that are more accurate, that incorporates all of these additional alternative payment methods will ultimately help borrowers, will help ultimately help lenders close more loans. The GSEs, um, will, it'll, it'll mitigate the risk for the GSEs, uh, for Fannie and Freddie and the government. And they believe that it's really gonna make it a more stable uh, market for everybody. So that's, coming up in, an, in the next few years. Now, let's talk about a few other unique features. And this, I think this may be my one, last slide here. Um, so some other features of the Vantage 4.0, and this is gonna help loan officers. This is gonna help borrowers as well. The 4.0 does not have a six month minimum. So what that means, the current FICO scores, in order for you, uh, your borrower to get a score, they have to have at least six months of history. 
So this, if you have a, you know, a foreign national, someone that just moved into the U.S., they opened up uh, some credit cards, you know, bought a car, now they want to buy a house. Well, you pull their credit, they have three or four accounts, but they've all been open for less than six months because they just moved here. They're not going to have credit scores. However, under the FICO 4 point, Vantage score 4.0, you only need one month of credit history in order to get a score. So if they were under this score, they would have been able to get scored. So that's one of the big changes in this Vantage 4.0, switches from a six month requirement to a one month requirement, okay? And they also treat collection accounts differently. Vantage 4.0 ignores all paid collections, not just paid medical collections, but they are gonna ignore all paid collections, no matter what type of collection it is. And it places less importance on unpaid medical collections. So even if your borrower has some medical collections that's, that's not, you know, that's unpaid, that's gonna be weighed less under this credit score. So <clears throat> it's not gonna impact their score as much in a negative way. Hey, Gordon? Yes. I have another question from Mark, and then Joseph is also asking it about when is when is too many credit card accounts become bad, or when does too many credit card accounts yeah. even have a lower zero balance? Sure. So there, there's really no number of how many accounts you have to that would end up you know being treated as a negative factor. The main main thing is you just need to make sure that they all have no lates and low balances. History and okay. low yeah, so I mean, you know, I've seen credit files with 20 credit cards and still, you know, a high 700 score because all her credit cards have low balances and no lates. So they don't count the number of uh, accounts you have as a negative factor. It's just your balance and history and payments. Okay. All right. And then Mark, did you have another question or is your yeah, hand still I have, up? I have two other questions. Could oh. you go back to the last slide, please, uh, Corin? Sure. Uh -huh. uh, the one more. Okay. So so for the rent and the uh, utility, uh, so normally they don't report it. So does it mean that the consumer need to report those uh, information in order to include it in the score? Um, that, that's a good the question. Rent? So the consumers can report rent through a, a service um, with the bureaus. But the way this is going to work is that the we're going to, um, not we, but they're going to look at the your bank information. So if you have if you're making rental payments each month through your bank, that's going to be factored into the decision. So there there is going to be a way for rental payments to be reported to the bureaus. Um, this hasn't taken effect yet. This was just announced. So this is going to be something in the next couple of years, and we're going to really see how it's going to be in, implemented. But they will find a way to either have the consumer report the rental information or they may get it reported from bank account uh, payment history or some other method. Okay. I see. The, sec the uh, second question I have is this. When we, oh, okay, so we're not going to take effect until uh, a couple of years later, right? Right. Correct. So we don't know until then. So I think my, I will wait for the question. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. No problem. Hey, hey, hey Gordon, I'm going to jump in one more question. Um, sure. With regards to the two new modeling uh, um, Vantage, and I think you said it was called the 10T. Yep, um, FICO 10T. Those, those two are going to be accepted by FHFA. My question is, are the three bureaus integrating those models into their scoring system as, as a, like an additional layer? Are they replacing the existing models they have? Or how does those models get integrated into the new reporting? Sure. I, I believe it's going to replace the existing model with these two new models. Um, so there, there's a lot of unknown questions about these two models and how it's going to be implemented because it's still probably about two years away, but uh, we know that they're gonna be replacing the current FICO models with these two new ones. And then, hey, Gordon, another quick question. It's, I just read too, that they're gonna only allow, they're gonna only allow two merged versus three merged as well. Exactly, and that's actually right here on this slide. Check it out. <laughs> Change from tri-merge to bi-merge. You are right on spot. That's a good segue. All right, so the FH, FA also announced they're working with the GSEs to change the requirement for lenders to pull a tri-merge credit report when submitting the file to Fannie and Freddie. Instead, they were switched to a bi-merge credit report from only the two, only two of the three bureaus using the two new score models. 
Okay, and this is great because for you know the last 25 years the bureaus had a monopoly. We we were you, you have to pull a trimers report to get findings from DU and LP, so they can charge whatever they want. Um, it was just a monopoly. Now, if they're saying you can pull two bureaus, this is going to cause some competition between the three bureaus. They may, you know, they may look at, you know, being more competitive. So really, the, one of the one of the purposes of the FHA FA to do this was to lower costs. Um, honestly, I don't think that's going to happen, and I'll tell you my reason why. But um, that was their intention. But with the um, to create some kind of competition. Um, so again, we, we don't know. There's a lot that's going to be unknown about this because it's still a couple of years away. So all we do know is there are two bureaus that uh, Fannie and Freddie are going to accept two bureaus instead of three bureaus. Um, does this mean that we can still pull a tri-merge report and maybe they'll just take the highest two scores? Or does it mean we don't need to pull tri-merge at all, that we're just going to pull two, two bureaus? So there's a lot of questions about how this is going to actually work. Uh, and I'm, you know, you know, I can't wait to find out myself, but because um, I think it's a huge change. Um, and how, so again, how is this going to impact the pricing of credit reports? We've been asked that quite a bit. Um, so Fair Isaac is corporation was the one that provided the tri merge report for all these years to the mortgage industry, making money on three bureaus. Now they've announced, well, they're no longer going to accept three bureaus. They're going to take two bureaus. And one of those scores are going to come from the credit bureau and Fair Isaac's going to provide the other. So really Fair Isaac's losing a lot of revenues because they're only going to, they're going to be cutting from a three bureau to offering just a one bureau from their company. So we got an announcement from Fair Isaac last month that they're going to increase the, the fee for their classic FICO scores by 350% by the end of this year. So, uh, uh, you know, it's that's an unprecedented increase. So I think until until these two score models are implemented, the whole industry is going to be paying double or triple for the cost of a credit report next year. I hate to say oh, that boy. because I hate to say that because we are a credit provider, but this is not coming from uh, you know our company. It's coming from Fair Isaac, and it's going to apply to every credit reporting provider out there. So if you're a uh, you know a uh, LO and you've been pulling credit, you can expect your credit fees to probably double or triple next year. Wow. I've heard that from other companies as well. And <laughs> yep. And I know uh, uh, Rob Chrisman made that announcement. He actually, he, he was one of the first to make an announcement a, a month ago, even before credit companies knew about it. <laughs> I don't know how, how Rob knows these things, <laughs> but um, so yeah, so that's something that's going to happen. So we're looking forward to when these two new score models are going to be implemented. Um, it's a multi-year effort. I don't think it's going to happen until maybe the last quarter of 2024. Hopefully it happens sooner, but until then, um, we're still going to be using the classic uh, classic FICO for at least- Gordon, can I, are you going to talk a little bit about uh, ITIN borrowers or international credit reports? I certainly can, because that's the end of my presentation there. Oh, so we can, awesome. we can talk about we could talk about anything now. But no, that has to be all with right. So, um, so borrowers yep. who have an ITIN who can yep. have ITIN credit, and um, borrowers who um, are you know from Canada or from England, they can have international credit. Uh, yep. And so my my question would be, uh, what do you have to do differently for something like that? Well, for if you, as far as international credit, the only uh, country that that provides a credit report is Canada. So you can pull a, an actual credit report for a Canada Canadian resident, putting in their Canadian address, Canadian social, and you can get a credit report back from Equifax. So Equifax is the only bureau that provides a Canadian credit report. Any other country, we there's no credit report that we can get for mortgage purposes. Um, you may, you know. You may have to, we can put together like a non-traditional credit report just based on information you provide us on the, from that borrower and we can put one together, but that's not gonna give you scores. That's not something reported by the bureaus. That's just something your credit company puts together and see if your lender can use it. So there's not too many options if you're a for international report other than Canada, okay? Now ITIN, um, you can pull credit report using an ITIN number. So I mean, if, when you're pulling credit, the ITIN number is, has the same number of digits as a social security number. So if you're just entering the ITIN, the system's just going to treat it like you're pulling credit with the social. And if the if that borrower has credit associated with the ITIN, then some credit should come back with scores. 
Now, along that lines, I have been able to get the uh, borrower's ITIN credit report, but it hasn't transferred because oftentimes when they come into the country, they're using a different social security number under how it was set up originally for amnesty. And now they have a social security number and now you're trying to get it under their social security number, but it's under their ITIN. They don't sure. seem to cross reference. Is there any special right. trick we can do to get a standard credit report? That in, in those cases, the consumer would have to reach out to the credit bureaus to merge those socials, the ITIN and social together onto one profile, and then we can pull the credit. But there's nothing on our end that we can do to kind of address for that because we don't, we're not aware of that other social. All we have in our system is the, you know, the ITIN. first social they have. So, um, yeah, so that's something that has to actually be um, resolved on the bureau side first before pulling credit. Um, you can also pull credit with all zeros. So if you have a, a potential borrower that doesn't have an ITIN or, you know, well, if maybe they have some credit under a false social, you can pull credit with all zeros. Um, sometimes, you know, nothing may come back, but maybe that's what the lender wants. They just want to report that blank. I had this happen and this was the first time I had had it happen. I, uh, wife, um, wasn't a citizen and, and wasn't uh, wasn't working here, uh, but her husband was on a you know a regular visa, um, and uh, she was on the loan, and we pulled it, and uh, I didn't realize she had put all zeros in, and she came up with a great credit score. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you can do that. You can use wow. all zeros to pull it. I mean, you know, whether or not you're going to get an accurate credit file, that's a different question, but you can, you know, it'll attempt to pull credit even if you put all zeros, because they're still going to look at the borrower's name, their address, date of birth, and try to find a credit file based on that, that information. Hmm? Any other questions? I think um, I covered most of the items that I wanted to cover on the presentation. Hey, well, Gordon, I'm going to... Great uh, information. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, TJ. Go ahead, Brian. Thanks. Just one last question. So I, I recently did a content video and I talked a little bit about improving credit scores on a short manner. And those of us who have been around a while, like yourself, um, always used to operate on if you keep your balances on your credit card under 50%, it'll improve your scores. Obviously, under 30% is optimal. Is there, um, am I right in telling clients, because sometimes we need to get their scores improved, but they don't have all the cash in the world to bring them down to 30% balances. Is yep. getting those balances down, pay down under 50, still going to give them ample improvement to their scores or should I not advise them of that? You know, it sometimes it's gonna depend on that specific credit profile. 50% is certainly gonna be better than 51%. Um, but we, you know, and, and I've seen so we, we run in, we see so many credit files and we run, we run simulations on these. So, you know, sometimes bringing that to 50, below 50% may help, other times it won't. So it's not really a generalization, it's gonna be, a depending on that person's profile. But if you can bring someone's credit down to 30%, the balance 30%, that's usually gonna help everybody. And, right? there, and there's two ways to do that. If they have a pretty big depth of a file, oftentimes they can increase their credit limit mm -hmm. and instead of paying off the balance. So there, there've been times I've advised them to just increase the credit limit amount. So it's still showing the utilization as a lower number, kind of going the opposite of paying it because cash is tough right now. For everybody to have for down payment. That's right. actually a really good suggestion. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let me see if there's any more questions in there. Go ahead and put them in the chat or raise your hand. I well, just send I'll, I'll jump on that, TJ. I'm oh, yeah. so sorry, but I, this is such a this is why I'm on this call because it's so valuable. Oh, yeah. um, just on the on the tail end of that, TJ, that's a great suggestion about increasing the credit limit, which would lower the the uh, use usable percentage. However, Gordon, wouldn't that also impact negatively that you're increasing the potential? Um, outstanding credit uh, usage and maybe have a negative impact? Um, I, I think it's still going to be a more positive outcome to lower your balance to high credit ratio. So, it's, we're, so we're talking two different things here. We're talking one is what's going to help your credit score. So doing what TJ said helps your credit score. What you might be referring to is what the lender is going to look at. Because if the lender sees that, well, now you have a potential to charge a lot more and go into more debt, they may, they may look at that in a negative manner, but the score itself would be improved by it. So Gordon, don't you think that if you have somebody that has balances at 50%, that if at least if you take down one card 
under 30%, that's going to help the FICO score versus trying to get all of them down. So if you're going to choose, choose a few to drop under 30% and leave the other ones at 50%. Yes, certainly. I mean, any individual credit card balance you can get below 30% is going to be helpful. Um, but you know, the more the more accounts you have that's over 50%, of course, the more detriment that's going to be on your balance on your credit score. So if it, ideally, I mean, if you can get all your credit cards below 50% and then a few of them below 30%, if you can, right. that would be ideal. And and that's another problem that you that we haven't really discussed is if somebody's limit is $1,500 and they have $1,526 out, that is actually a negative on your credit because you've exceeded the amount that you were granted and they'll let you do it. But it yep. really could drop your score 75, even 100 points if you have one, more than one of those and it's an excessive amount. So watch those as well uh, when you're when you're looking at credit work. Yep, absolutely. And and with trended data now that they look at that for you know, 24 months now, too, so they can see that, OK, there's a month that you actually exceeded your credit limit and that's going to go against you. And And the deeper we get into this recession the more that trended data is going to be impactful. If we're seeing that we, we have receding income from our consumers, because now they used to pay off their credit cards every month and then they've only been doing minimum payments for the last six, eight months, that that's going to look as a risk for the underwriting criteria. So you, you just have to know that this, especially as we go into this recession, that trended data is going to be looked at harder. I agree. All Good right. Point. Any other questions? I, I know, Brian, you got a whole bunch in your brain. What you got? <laughs> what you got, Brian? No, you're, you're off the hook, TJ. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a really important topic because educating our consumers so that they can have the most successful home ownership or the most successful refinance opportunity or the best possible rates, uh, you know, and all of those types of things, you know, is, is how we give good service. And uh, we really appreciate Gordon coming on. Gordon, will you make sure that you put your contact information in the chat box so that uh, these mortgage professionals can reach out to you and, uh, and get to know you a little bit better. We always appreciate your support at Silicon Valley Camp. Um, I did see that we had another board member jump on. Ruth, uh, if you want to pop on and say hello. Well, I'm here, but my camera's not turning on, so <laughs> I'm trying to click on it, and I don't know what's going on, but I'm here. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and Ruth, why don't you tell us what you do so that, that our, our group can know who you are? Well, I do several different things, but one of them is we help people get out of debt in record time with using their current budget. So um, it's just all about eliminating the interest that you're paying to the banks. And the important thing about this to me, you know, it doesn't matter what the interest rate is. If you focus on getting that balance paid off as soon as possible, you really won't be paying seven, eight percent. You'll be paying a lot less if you can get the borrowers to focus on getting that debt paid off and not just go, oh, that's my payment for the month. I'm good. Try to get them to pay more. Absolutely. My little rule of thumb on my mortgage when I was able to get it into the twos is uh, I want 51% of my payment each month to go to principal. <laughs> exactly. I know. Just, I, would... you know, I mean, it's just a little bit more, but you know, just, you know, <laughs> click it on. I, up. I was shocked when I just got my mortgage last year and my payment's $1,800 a month and only 400 was going to principal. I'm like, this is stupid. None of us would open credit cards like this. We need to get the mortgages paid off as soon as possible. Absolutely. Gaining wealth through equity. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I know that uh, I put in the chat box uh, and on our email, I sent everybody a copy of our presentation. And um, we'd love to see you at the holiday event in, on December 7th at Maggiano's. Please, you are all welcome to join us for that celebration. Also, if you are not a member, please log on to our website. You can also join there. And we have coming up 
in January, end of January, we're going to have David Luna come out and do a lunch and learn for the realtors, as well as for the uh, loan officers over at SCORE. So stay tuned for that. He's going to be talking about how is this uh, economy going to hit you and where are we and, and start the year off right. So it should be a great topic, great opportunity to work with our realtors and solidify those relationships and help them know about what lending is and how it impacts their business. So, um, Joseph is party. No, you don't have to be a member to come to the party. We'd love to have you. It's a great speaker. So yeah, come on down. And uh, yeah, I'm already decorated for Christmas. See, you know, I already have my tree up. It's fake, but yeah, we can pretend that's my tree. <laughs> All right. Uh, happy November. Happy Thanksgiving and happy Veterans Day. And thank you for all who served. We will yes. see you real soon. Thanks, Jack, for setting up the meeting. And thanks again, Gordon. We thank really you, Gordon. appreciate your yes. insight. You're welcome. Great seeing everybody. Yes, sir. Thanks, Gordon. It was great. TJ, why are you decorated for Thanksgiving or for Christmas already? I didn't have a Thanksgiving backdrop. <laughs> Remind me, I'll send you one. <laughs> okay. It was either that or Halloween. <laughs>